Chapter Ten of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Ten, The Day We Celebrate. The days that followed were to Billy much like a delicious dream. Sometimes he stopped short and wondered uneasily if he would wake up pretty soon to find that he was still in exile from the double crank, wandering with Dill over the country in search of a location. Sometimes he laughed aloud unexpectedly and said, Hell, in a chuckling undertone, when came fresh realization of the miracle. But mostly he was an exceedingly busy young man, with hands and brain too full of the stress of business to do much wondering. They were in possession of the double crank now, he in full charge, walking the path which his own feet, when he was merely a forty-dollar puncher, had helped wear deep to the stable in corrals, giving orders where he had been wont to receive them, riding horses which he had long completed, but which had heretofore been kept sacred to the use of Jawbreaker and Old Brown himself, eating and sleeping in the house with Dill instead of making one of the crowd in the bunkhouse, ordering the coming and going of the round-up crew and tasting to the full the joys and the sorrows of being head push where he had for long been content to serve. Truly, the world had changed amazingly for one charming Billy Boyle. Most of the men he had kept on, for he liked them well, and they had faith to believe that success would not spoil him. The pilgrim he had promised himself the pleasure of firing bodily off the ranch within an hour of his first taking control, but the pilgrim had not waited. He had left the ranch with the old man, and where he had gone did not concern Billy at the time. For there was the shipment of young stock from the south to meet and drive up to the home range, and there was the calf roundup to start on time and after all the red tape of buying the outfit and turning over the stock had been properly wound up, time was precious in the extreme through May and June, and well into July. But habit is strong upon a man even after the conditions which bred the habit have utterly changed. One privilege had been always kept inviolate at the double crank, until it had come to be looked upon as an inalienable right. The glorious fourth had been celebrated come rain, come shine, Usually the celebration was so generous that it did not stop at midnight. Anywhere within a week was considered permissible, a gradual tapering off, not to say sobering up, being the custom with the more hilarious souls. When Dill, with much solemnity, tore off June from the calendar in the dining room, the calendar with Custer's last charge rioting redly above the dates, Billy, home for a day from the roundup, realized suddenly that time was on the high lope. At least, that is how he put it to Dill. Say, Dilly, we sure got to jar loose from getting rich long enough to take in that picnic over at Bluebell Grove. Didn't know there was a picnic or a Bluebell Grove? Well, now there is. Over on Horn Toad Creek. Nice, pretty name to go with the grove, ain't it? They got a patch of shade big over as my hat. Right back up on the hill is the schoolhouse where they do their dancing, and they've got a table or two and a swing for the kids to fall out of and they call it Bluebell Grove cause you never saw a bluebell within ten mile of the place. That's where the general roundup for the fourth is pulled off this year. So Jim Bleeker was telling me this morning. We sure got to be present, Dilly. I'm afraid I'm not the sort of man to shine in society, William, dissented the other modestly. You can go and... Don't you never dance? Billy eyed him speculatively. A man under fifty and Dill might be anywhere between thirty and forty, who had two sound legs and yet did not dance. Oh, I used to, after a fashion, but my feet are so far off that I find communication with them necessarily slow, and they have a habit of embarking in wild ventures of their own. I do not believe they are really popular with the feminine element, William, and so I'd rather... Ah, uh, you'll have to go and try the world anyhow. We ain't any of us experts. You see, the boys have been accustomed to having the wheels of industry stop revolving on the 4th and turning kind of wobbly for four or five days after. I don't feel like trying to break them in to keep on working, do you? To use your own term, said Dill, suddenly reckless of his diction, you're sure the doctor. Well, then, the proper dope for this case is all hands show up at the picnic. He picked up his hat from the floor slapped it twice against his leg to remove the dust, pinched the crown into four dents, set it upon his head at a jaunty angle, and went out singing softly. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. 
dill looking after him puckered his face into what passed with him for a smile i wonder now he meditated aloud if william is not thinking of some particular young lady who er uh, who cannot leave her mother if he had only known it william was he was also wondering whether she would be at the picnic and if she were at the picnic would she remember him he had only seen her that one night and to him it seemed a very long while ago he thought however that he might be able to recall himself to her mind supposing she had forgotten it was a long time ago he kept reminding himself and the light was poor and he hadn't shaved for a week he had always afterward realized that with much mental discomfort and he really did look a lot different when he had on his war togs by which he meant his best clothes he wouldn't blame her at all if she passed him up for a stranger just at first a great deal more he thought on the same subject and quite as foolishly because of much thinking on the subject when he and dill rode down the trail which much recent passing had made unusually dusty with the hot sunlight of the fourth making the air quiver palpably around them with the cloudless blue arching hotly over their heads and with the four by six cotton flag flying an involuntary signal of distress on account of its being hastily raised bottom side up and left that way and beckoning them from the little clump of shade below the heart of charming billy boyle beat unsteadily under the left pocket of his soft cream-colored silk shirt and the cheeks of him glowed red under the coppery tan dill was not the sort of man who loves fast riding and they ambled along quite decorously like we was headed for prayer meeting with a singing book under each elbow thought billy secretly resentful of the pace i reckon there'll be quite a crowd he remarked wistfully i see a good many horses staked out already dill nodded absently and billy took to singing his pet ditty one must do something when one is covering the last mile of a journey toward a place full of all sorts of delightful possibilities and covering that mile at a shambling trot which is truly maddening she can make a pumpkin pie quick's a cat can wink her eye she's a young thing and cannot leave her mother but of course observed mr dill quite unexpectedly you know william time will remedy that drawback billy started looked suspiciously at the other grew rather red and shut up like a clam he did more he put the spurs to his horse and speedily hid himself in a dust cloud so that dill dutifully keeping pace with him made a rather spectacular arrival whether he would or no charming billy his hat carefully dimpled his blue tie fastidiously knotted and pierced with the klondike nugget pin which was his only ornament wandered hastily through the assembled groups and slapped viciously at mosquitoes twice he shied at a flutter of woman garments retreated to a respectable distance and reconnoitred with a fine air of indifference to find that the flutter accompanied the movements of some girl for whom he cared not at all in his nostrils was the indefinable unmistakable picnic odor the odor of crushed grasses and damp leaf mold stirred by the passing of many feet the mingling of cheap perfumes and starched muslin and iced lemonade and sandwiches in his ears the jumble of laughter and of holiday speech the squealing of children in a mob around the swing the protesting squeak of the ropes as they swung high the snorting of horses tied just outside the enchanted ground and through the treetops he could glimpse the rangeland lying asleep in the hot sunlight unchanged uncaring with the wild range cattle feeding leisurely upon the slopes and lifting heads occasionally to snuff suspiciously the unwonted sounds and smells that drifted up to them on vagrant breezes he introduced dill to four or five men whom he thought might be congenial left him talking solemnly with a man who at some half-forgotten period had come from michigan and wandered aimlessly on through the grove fellows there were in plenty who he knew but he passed them with a brief word or two truth to tell for the most part they were otherwise occupied and had no time for him he loitered over to the swing saw that the enthusiasts who were making so much noise were all youngsters under fifteen or so and that they hailed his coming with a joy tinged with self-interest he rose to the bait of one dark-eyed miss who had her hair done in two braids crossed and tied close to her head with red white and blue ribbon and who smiled alluringly and somewhat toothlessly and remarked that she liked to go way way up till it most turned over and that it didn't scare her a bit 
he swung her almost into hysterics and straightway found himself exceedingly popular with the other braided and tied young misses charming billy never could tell afterward how long or how many he swung way way up he knew that he pushed and pushed until his arms ached and the hair on his forehead became unpleasantly damp under his hat that'll just have to do you kids he rebelled suddenly and left them anxiously patting his hair and generally resettling himself as he went once more in a dispirited fashion he threaded the crowd which had grown somewhat larger sidestepped a group which called after him and went on down to the creek i'm about the limit i guess he told himself irritably why the dickens didn't i have the sense and nerve to ride over and ask her straight out if she was coming i could have drove her over maybe if she'd come with me i could have took the bay team and top buggy and done the thing right i could have hell there's a heap of things i could have done that would have been a lot more wise than what i did do maybe she ain't coming at all and on the heels of that he saw a spring wagon come rattling down the trail across the creek there were two seats full and two parasols were bobbing seductively and one of them was blue i'll bet a dollar that's them now murmured billy and once more felt anxiously of his hair where it had gone limp under his hat darn kids they'd a kept me there till i looked like i'd been rattling calves half a day went with a patting he turned and went briskly through an empty and untrampled part of the grove to the place where the wagon would be most likely to stop i'm sure going to make good today or and a little further what if it ain't them speedily he discovered that it was them and at the same time he discovered something else which pleased him not at all dressed with much care so that even billy must reluctantly own him good-looking enough and riding so close to the blue parasol that his horse barely escaped grazing a wheel was the pilgrim he glared at billy in unfriendly fashion and would have shut him off completely from approach to the wagon but a shining milk can left carelessly by a bush caught the eye of his horse and after that the pilgrim was very busy riding erratically in circles and trying to keep in touch with his saddle billy grown surprisingly bold went straight to where the blue parasol was being closed with dainty deliberation a little more and you'd have been late for dinner he announced smiling up at her and held out his eager arms diplomacy perhaps should have urged him to assist the other lady first but billy boyle was quite too direct to be diplomatic and besides the other lady was on the opposite side from him miss bridger may have been surprised and she may or may not have been pleased billy could only guess at her emotions granting she felt any but she smiled down at him and permitted the arms to receive her and she also permitted though with some hesitation billy to lead her straight away from the wagon and its occupants and from the gyrating pilgrim to the deep delights of the grove mr walland is a good rider don't you think murmured miss bridger gazing over her shoulder he's a bird said billy evenly and was polite enough not to mention what kind of bird he was wondering what on earth had brought those two together and why after that night miss bridger should be friendly with the pilgrim but of these things he said nothing though he did find a good deal to say upon pleasanter subjects so far as any one knew charming billy boyle while he had done many things had never before walked boldly into a picnic crowd carrying a blue parasol as if it were a rifle and keeping step as best he might over the humps and hollows of the grove with a young woman many there were who turned and looked again and these were the men who knew him best as for billy his whole attitude was one of determination he was not particularly lover-like had he wanted to be he would not have known how he was resolved to make the most of his opportunities because they were likely to be few and because he had an instinct that he should know the girl better he had even dreamed foolishly once or twice of some day marrying her but to clinch all he had no notion of letting the pilgrim offend her by his presence so he somehow got her wedged between two fat women at one of the tables and stood behind and passed things impartially and ate ham sandwiches and other indigestibles during the intervals he had the satisfaction of seeing the pilgrim come within ten feet of them hover there scowling for a minute or two and then retreat he ain't forgot the lickin i gave him thought billy vaingloriously and hid a smile in the delectable softness of a wedge of cake with some kind of creamy filling i made that cake announced miss bridger over her shoulder when she saw what he was eating 
Do you like it as well as chicken stew? Whereupon Billy murmured incoherently and wished the two fat women ten miles away. He had not dared, he would never have dared, refer to that night, or mention chicken stew or prune pies or even dried apricots in her presence. But with her own hand she had brushed aside the veil of constraint that had hung between them. I wish I'd thought to bring a prune pie, he told her daringly, in his eagerness half strangling over a crumb of cake. Nobody wants prune pie at a picnic, declared one of the fat women sententiously. You might as well bring fried bacon and done with it. Picnics, added the other and fatter woman, is for getting something to eat you don't have every day's at home. To point the moral, she reached for a plate of fluted and iced molasses cakes. I love prune pies, asserted Miss Bridger, and laughed at the snorts which came from either side. Billy felt himself four inches taller just then. Give me stewed prairie chicken, he stooped to murmur in her ear, or, to be exact, in the blue bow on her hat. Ah, you folks didn't ought to come to a picnic, grunted the fatter woman in disgust. The two who had the secret between them laughed confidentially, and Miss Bridger even turned her head away around so that their eyes could meet and emphasize the joke. Billy looked down at the big blue bow and at the soft, blue, roughly stuff on her shoulders, stuff that was just thin enough so that one caught elusive suggestions of the soft, pinky flesh beneath, and wondered vaguely why he had never noticed the beating in his throat before, and what would happen if he reached around and tilted back her chin and... Thunder! I guess I've sure got him all right, he brought himself up angrily, and refrained from carrying the subject further. It was rumored that the dancing would shortly begin in the schoolhouse up the hill, and Billy realized suddenly, with some compunction, that he had forgotten all about Dill. "'I want to introduce my new boss to you, Miss Bridger,' he said when they had left the table, and she was smoothing down the roughly blue stuff in her adorably feminine way. "'He didn't much just to look at, but he's the whitest man I ever knew. You wait here a minute, and I'll go find him.' Which was a foolish thing for him to do, as he afterward found out. For when he had hunted the whole length of the grove, he found Dill standing like a blasted pine tree in the middle of a circle of men, men who were married and so were not wholly taken up with the feminine element, and he was discoursing to them earnestly and grammatically upon the capitalistic tendencies of modern politics. Billy stood and listened long enough to see that there was no hope of weaning his interest immediately, and then went back to where he had left Miss Bridger. She was not there. He looked through the nearest groups, approached one of the fat women, who was industriously sorting the remains of the feast and depositing the largest and most attractive pieces of cake in her own basket, and made bold to inquire if she knew where Miss Bridger had gone. "'Gone home after some prune pie, I guess, maybe,' she retorted quellingly, and Billy asked no farther. Later he caught sight of a blue flutter in the swing, investigated and saw that it was Miss Bridger, and that the pilgrim, smiling and with his hat set jauntily back on his head, was pushing the swing. They did not catch sight of Billy, for he did not linger there. He turned short around, walked purposefully out to the edge of the grove where his horse was feeding at the end of his rope, picked up the rope, and led the horse over to where his saddle lay on its side. The neatly folded saddle blanket lay across it. Darn it! Stand still! he growled unjustly when the horse merely took the liberty of switching a fly off his rump. Billy picked up the blanket, shook the wrinkles out mechanically, held it before him ready to lay across the waiting back of Barney, shook it again, hesitated, and threw it violently back upon the saddle. "'Go on off. I don't want nothing of you,' he admonished the horse, which turned and looked at him inquiringly. "'I ain't through yet. I got another chip to put up.' He made him a cigarette, lighted it, and strolled nonchalantly back to the grove. End of chapter 10「by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 11. When I Lift My Eyebrows This Way. Oh, where have you been, Billy boy, Billy boy? Oh, where have you been, charming Billy? Somewhere behind him a daring young voice was singing. Billy turned with a real start, and when he saw her coming gaily down a little brush-hidden path and knew that she was alone, the heart of him turned a complete somersault from the feel of it. 
My long friend Dilly was busy, and so I, I went to look after my horse, he explained, his mind somewhat in a jumble. How came she to be there, and why did she sing those lines? How did she know that was his song, or did she really care at all? And where was the pilgrim? Mr. Walland and I tried the swing, but I don't like it. It made me horribly dizzy, she said, coming up to him. Then I went to find Mama Joy. Who? Billy had by that time recovered his wits enough to know just exactly what she said. Mama Joy, my stepmother. I call her that. You see, Father wants me to call her Mama. He really wanted it Mother, but I couldn't. And she's so young to have me for a daughter, so she wants me to call her Joy. That's her name. So I call her both and please them both, I hope. Did you ever study diplomacy, Mr. Boyle? I never did, but I'm going to start right in, Billy told her, and half meant it. A thorough understanding of the subject is indispensable when you have a stepmother, a young stepmother. You've met her, haven't you? No, said Billy. He did not want to talk about her stepmother, but he hated to tell her so. Uh, yes. I believe I did see her once, come to think of it he added honestly when the memory prompted him. Miss Bridger laughed, stopped, and laughed again. How Mama Joy would hate you if she knew that, she exclaimed relishfully. Why? Oh, you wait. If ever I tell her that you, that anybody ever met her and then forgot, why, she knows the color of your hair and eyes, and she knows the pattern of that horsehair hat band and the size of your boots. She admires a man whose feet haven't two or three inches for every foot of his height. She says you wear fives, and you don't lack much for being six feet tall, and... Oh, for heaven's sake, protested Billy, very red and uncomfortable. What have I done to you that you throw it into me like that? My hands are up, and there stay up if you only quit it. Miss Bridger looked at him sidelong and laughed to herself. That's to pay you for forgetting that you ever met Mama Joy, she asserted. I shouldn't be surprised if next week you'll have forgotten that you ever met me. And if you do, after that chicken stew... You're a josher, said Billy helplessly, not being prepared to say just all he thought about the possibility of his forgetting her. He wished that he understood women better, so that he might the better cope with the vagaries of this one and so great was his ignorance that he never dreamed that every man since Adam had wished the same thing quite as futilely. I'm not going to Josh now, she promised, with a quick change of manner. You haven't. I know you haven't, but I'll give you a chance to dissemble. You haven't a partner for the dance, have you? No. Have you? Billy did have the courage to say that, though he dared not say more. Well, I... I could be persuaded she hinted shamelessly. Persuade nothing. You belong to me, and if anybody tries to throw his loop over your head, why... Billy looked dangerous. He meant the pilgrim. Thank you. She seemed relieved, and it was plain she did not read into his words any meaning beyond the dance, though Billy was secretly hoping that she would. Do you know, I think you're perfectly lovely. You're so... so comfortable. When I've known you a little longer, I expect I'll be calling you Charming Billy, or else Billy Boy. If you'll stick close to me all through this dance and come every time I lift my eyebrows this way. She came near getting kissed right then, but she never knew it. And say it's your dance, and that I promised it to you before. I'll be awfully grateful and obliged. I uh, wished, said Billy pensively. I had the nerve to take all this for sudden admiration, but I savvy all right. Some poor devil's going to get it handed to him tonight. For the first time, Miss Bridger blushed consciously. I, well, you'll be good and obliging and do just what I want, won't you? Sure, said Billy, not trusting himself to say more. Indeed, he had to set his teeth hard on that word to keep more from tumbling out. Miss Bridger seemed all at once anxious over something. You waltz in two-step and polka and shottish, don't you? Her eyes, as she looked up at him, reminded Billy achingly of that time in the line camp 
when she asked him for a horse to ride home they had the same wistful pleading look billy gritted his teeth sure he answered again miss bridger sighed contentedly i know it's horribly mean and selfish of me but you're so good and i'll make it up to you some time really i will at some other dance you needn't dance with me once or look at me even that will even things up won't it sure said billy for the third time they paced slowly coming into view of the picnic crowd hearing the incoherent murmur of many voices miss bridger looked at him uncertainly laughed a little and spoke impulsively you needn't do it mr boyle unless you like it's only a joke anyway i mean my throwing myself at you like that just a foolish joke i'm often foolish you know of course i know you wouldn't misunderstand or anything like that but it is mean of me to drag you into it by the hair of your head almost just to play a joke on someone on mamma joy you're too good-natured you're a direct temptation to people who haven't any conscience really and truly you needn't do it at all you haven't heard me raisin any howl have you inquired billy eyeing her slantwise i'm playing big luck if you ask me well if you really don't mind and haven't anyone else i haven't billy assured her unsmilingly and i really don't mind i think i kind of like the prospect he was trying to match her mood and he was not at all sure that he was a success there's one thing if you get tired of having me under your feet all the time why billy's a stranger and an awful fine fella i'd like to have you well be kind of nice to him i want him to have a good time you see and you'll like him you can't help it and it will square up anything you may feel you might owe me i'll be just lovely to dilly miss bridger promised him with emphasis it will be a fair bargain then and i won't feel so so small about asking you what i did you can help me play a little joke and i'll dance with dilly so she finished in a tone of satisfaction we'll be even i feel a great deal better now because i can pay you back billy on that night was more keenly observant than usual and there was much that he saw he saw at once that miss bridger lifted her eyebrows in the way she had demonstrated as this way whenever the pilgrim approached her he saw that the pilgrim was looking extremely bloodthirsty and went out frequently billy guessed shrewdly that his steps led to where the drink was not water and the sight cheered him considerably it had hurt him a little to observe that when the pilgrim was absent or showed no sign of meaning to intrude upon her miss bridger did not lift her eyebrows consciously still she was at all times pleasant and friendly and he tried to be content mr boyle you've been awfully good she rewarded him when it was over and i think mr dill is fine do you know he waltzes beautifully i'm sure it was easy to keep my side of the bargain billy noticed the slight inquiring emphasis upon the word my and he smiled down reassuringly at her face of course mine was pretty hard he teased but i hope i make good all right you she said looking steadily up at him are just exactly what i said you were you are comfortable billy did a good deal of thinking while he saddled barney in the gray of the morning with dill at a little distance looking taller than ever in the half light when he gave the saddle its final little tentative shake and pulled the stirrup around so that he could stick in his toe he gave also a snort of dissatisfaction hell he said to himself i don't know as i care about being too blame comfortable there's a limit to that kind of thing with her what's that called dill who had heard his voice ah oh, nothing lied billy swinging up i was just cussing my boss End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Twelve. Dilly hires a cook. It is rather distressful when one cannot recount all sorts of exciting things as nicely fitted together as if they had been carefully planned and rehearsed beforehand. 
It would have been extremely gratifying and romantic if charming Billy Boyle had dropped everything in the line of work and had ridden indefatigably the trail which led to Bridger's. It would have been exciting if he had sought out the pilgrim and precipitated trouble and flying lead. But Billy, though he might have enjoyed it, did none of those things. He rode straight to the ranch with Dill, rather silent, to be sure, but bearing none of the marks of a lovelorn young man drank three cups of strong coffee with four heaping teaspoonfuls of sugar to each cup, pulled off his boots, lay down upon the most convenient bed, and slept until noon. When the smell of dinner assailed his nostrils, he sat up yawning and a good deal tussled, drew on his boots, and made him a cigarette. After that he ate the dinner with relish, saddled and rode away to where the roundup was camped, his manner utterly practical and lacking the faintest tinge of romance. As to his thoughts, he kept them jealously to himself. He did not even glimpse Miss Bridger for three months or more. He was full of the affairs of the double crank, riding in great haste to the ranch or to town, hurrying back to the roundup and working much as he used to work, except that now he gave commands instead of receiving them. For they were short-handed that summer, and, as he explained to Dill, he couldn't afford to ride around and look as important as he felt. You wait, Dilly, till we get things running the way I want em, he encouraged on one of his brief calls at the ranch. I was kind of surprised to find things wasn't going as smooth as I used to think. When you haven't got the whole responsibility on your shoulders, you don't realize what a lot of things need to be done. There's them corrals, for instance. I help mend and fix em and toggle em, but it never struck me how rotten they are till I looked em over this spring. There's about a million things to do before the snow flies, or we won't be able to start out fresh in the spring with everything running smooth. And if I was you, Dilly, I'd go on a still hunt for another cook here at the ranch. This coffee's something fierce. I had my doubts about Sandy when we hired him. He always did look to me like he was built for herding sheep more than he was for cooking. This was in August. I have been thinking seriously of getting someone else in his place, Dill answered in his quiet way. There isn't very much to do here. If someone came who would take an interest and cook just what we wanted, I will own I have no taste for that peculiar mixture, which Sandy calls mulligan, and I have frequently told him so. Yet he insists on serving it twice a day. He says it uses up the scraps, but since it is never eaten, I cannot see where lies the economy. Well, I'd can him and hunt up a freshen, Billy repeated emphatically, looking with disapproval into his cup. I will say that I have already taken steps towards getting one of whom I believe I can depend, said Dill, and turned the subject. That was the only warning Billy had of what was to come. Indeed, there was nothing in the conversation to prepare him, even in the slightest degree, for what happened when he galloped up to the corral late one afternoon in October. It was a season of frosty mornings and of languorous, smoke-veiled afternoons, when summer has grown weary of resistance and winter is growing bolder in his advances, and the two have met in a passion-warmed embrace. Billy had ridden far with his riders and the trailing wagons, in the zest of his young responsibility sweeping the range to its farthest boundary of river or mountain. They were not through yet, but they had swung back within riding distance of the home ranch, and Billy had come in for nearly a month's accumulation of mail and to see how Dill was getting on. He was tired and dusty and hungry enough to eat the fringes off his chaps. He came to the ground without any spring in his muscles and walked stiffly to the stable door, leading his horse by the bridle reins. He meant to turn him loose in the stable, which was likely to be empty, and shut the door upon him until he himself had eaten something. The door was open, and he went in unthinkingly, seeing nothing in the gloom. It was his horse which snorted and settled back on the reins and otherwise professed his reluctance to enter the place. Charming Billy, as was consistent with his hunger and his weariness and the general mood of him, cussed rather fluently and jerked the horse forward a step or two before he saw someone poised hesitatingly upon the manger in the nearest stall. "'I guess he's afraid of me.' ventured a voice that he felt to his toes i was hunting eggs they lay them always in the awkwardest places to get at she scrambled down and came toward him bareheaded 
with the sleeves of her blue and white striped dress rolled to her elbows flora bridger if you please billy stood still and stared trying to make the reality of her presence seem reasonable and he failed utterly his most coherent thought at the moment was a shamed remembrance of the way he had sworn at his horse miss bridger stood aside from the wild-eyed animal and smiled upon his master in the language of the range come alive mr boyle she told him say howdy do and be nice about it or or i'll see that your coffee is muddy and your bread burned and your steak absolutely impregnable because i'm here to stay mind you mama joy and i have possession of your kitchen and so you'd better i'm trying to let it soak into my brains said billy you're just about the last person on earth i expect to see here hunting eggs like you had a right i have a right she asserted your dilly he's a perfect love and i told him so said i was to make myself perfectly at home so i have a perfect right to be here and a perfect right to hunt eggs and if i could make that sentence more perfect i would do it she tilted her head to one side and challenged a laugh with her eyes charming billy relaxed a bit yanked the horse into a stall and tied him fast you might tell me how it happened that you're here he hinted looking at her over the saddle he had apparently forgotten that he had intended leaving the horse saddled until he was rested and eaten and truly it would be a shame to hurry from so unexpected a tete-a-tete -tete. miss bridger pulled a spear of blue joint hay from a crack in the wall and began breaking it into little pieces it sounds funny but mr dill bought father out to get a cook the way it was father has been simply crazy to try his luck up in klondike it's just like him to get the fever after everybody else has had it and recovered when the whole country was wild to go he turned up his nose at the idea and now mind you after one or two whom he knew came back with some gold he must go and dig up a few million tons of it for himself your dilly is rather bright you know he met father and heard all about his complaint how he'd go to the klondike in a minute if he could only get the ranch and mama joy and me off his hands so what does dilly do but buy the old ranch and hire mama joy and me to come here and keep house father i am ashamed to say was abjectly grateful to get rid of his encumbrances and he he hit the trail immediately she stopped and searched absently with her fingers for another spear of hay do you know mr boyle i think men are the most irresponsible creatures a woman wouldn't turn her family over to a neighbor and go off like that for three or four years just chasing a sunbeam i i am horribly disappointed in father a man has no right to a family when he puts everything else first in his mind he'll be gone three or four years and and will spend all he has and we can shift for ourselves he only left us a hundred dollars to use in an emergency he was afraid he might need the rest to buy out a claim or get machinery or something so if we don't like it here we'll have to stay anyway we're we we're up against it as you fellows say charming billy fumbled the latigo absently felt a sudden belligerence toward her father he ought to have his head punched good and plenty he blurted sympathetically to his amazement miss bridger threw herself up and started for the door i'm very sorry you don't like the idea of us being here mr boyle she replied coldly but we happen to be here and i'm afraid you'll have to make the best of it billy was at that moment pulling off the saddle by the time he had carried it from the stall hung it upon its accustomed spike and hurried to the door miss bridger was nowhere to be seen he said hell under his breath and took long steps to the house but she did not appear to be there it was mama joy yellow-haired extremely blue-eyed and full-figured who made his coffee and gave him delicious things to eat things which he failed properly to appreciate because he ate with his ears perked to catch the faintest sound of another woman's steps and with his eyes turning constantly from door to window he did not even know half the time what mama joy was saying or see her dimples when she smiled and mama joy was rather proud of her dimples and was not accustomed to having them overlooked he was too proud to ask at supper-time where miss bridger was 
She did not choose to give him sight of her, and so he talked and talked to Dill, and even to Mama Joy, hoping that Miss Bridger could hear him and know that he wasn't worrying a darn bit. He did not consider that he had said anything so terrible. What had she gone on like that about her father for, if she couldn't stand for anyone siding with her? Maybe he had put his sympathy a little too strong, but that is the way men handle each other. She ought to know he wasn't sorry she was there. Why, of course she knew that. The girl wasn't a fool, and she must know a fellow would be plumb tickled to have her around every day. Well, anyway, he wasn't going to begin by letting her lead him around by the nose, and he wasn't going to crumple down on his knees and tell her to please walk all over him. Well, anyway, he summed up at bedtime with a somewhat doubtful satisfaction. I guess she's kind of got over the notion that I'm so blank comfortable, like I was an old grandpa settin' in a corner. She's got to get over it by thunder. I ain't got to that point yet. Hell no, I should say I hadn't. It is a fact that when he rode away just after sunrise next morning, he would have given much if duty and his pride had permitted him to linger a while. No one could have accused him of being in any degree a comfortable young man, for his last sight of Miss Bridger had been the flutter of her when she disappeared through the stable door. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of the Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Thirteen. Billy Meets the Pilgrim. The weeks that followed did not pass as quickly as before for Billy Boyle, nor did raking the range with his riders bring quite as keen a satisfaction with life. Always, when he rode apart in the soft haze and watched the skyline shimmer and dance toward him, and then retreat like a teasing maid, his thoughts wandered from the range and the cattle and the men who rode at his bidding, and rested with one slim young woman who puzzled and tantalized him and caused him more mental discomfort than he had ever known in his life before that night when she entered so unexpectedly the lion camp and his life. He scarcely knew just how he did feel toward her. Sometimes he hungered for her with every physical and mental fiber, and was tempted to leave everything and go to her. Times there were when he resented deeply her treatment of him, and repeated to himself the resolution not to lie down and let her walk all over him, just because he liked her. When the roundup was over, and the last of the beef on the way to Chicago, and the fat Irish cook gathered up the reins of his four-horse team, mounted with a grunt to the high seat of the mess wagon, and pointed his leaders thankfully into the trail which led to the double crank, though the sky was a hard gray and the wind blew chill with the bite of winter, and though tiny snowflakes drifted aimlessly to earth with a quite deceitful innocence as if they knew nothing of more to come and were only idling through the air, the blood of charming Billy rioted warmly through his veins, and his voice had a lilt which it had long lacked, and he sang again the pitifully foolish thing with which he was wont to voice his joy in living. I've been to see my wife, she's the joy of my life, she's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. Thought Bill had got too proud to sing that song of his'n, the cook yelled facetiously to the riders who were nearest. I was looking for him to bust out in Grand Opry or something else that's a heap more stylish than his old come all ye. Charming Billy turned and rested a hand briefly upon the cattle, while he told the cook laughingly to go to the hot place, and then settled himself to the pace that matched the leaping blood of him. That pace soon discouraged the others and left them jogging leisurely a mile or two in the rear, and it also brought him the sooner to his destination. "'Wonder if she's mad yet?' he asked himself when he dismounted. No one seemed to be about, but he reflected that it was just about noon and they would probably be at dinner. And, besides, the weather was not the sort to invite one outdoors unless driven by necessity. The smell of roast meat, coffee, and some sort of pie assailed his nostrils pleasantly when he came to the house, and he went in eagerly by the door, which would bring him directly to the dining-room. As he had guessed, they were seated at the table." why come in william dill greeted a welcoming note in his voice we weren't looking for you but you are in good time we've only just begun how do you do mr boyle miss bridger added demurely 
Hello, Bill. How are you coming? cried another, and it was to him that the eyes of Billy Boyle turned bewilderedly. That the pilgrim should be seated calmly at the double crank table never once occurred to him. In his thoughts of Miss Bridger, he had mentally eliminated the pilgrim, for had she not been particular to show the pilgrim that his presence was extremely undesirable that night at the dance? Hello, folks, he answered them all quietly, because there was nothing else he could do until he had time to think. Miss Bridger had risen and was smiling at him in a friendly fashion, exactly as if she had never run away from him and stayed away all the evening because she was angry. I'll fix you a place she announced briskly. Of course you're hungry. And if you want to wash off the dust of travel, there's plenty of warm water out here in the kitchen. I'll get you some. She may not have meant that for an invitation, but Billy followed her into the kitchen and calmly shut the door behind him. She dipped warm water out of the reservoir for him and hung a fresh towel on the nail above the washstand in the corner and seemed about to leave him again. You mad yet? asked Billy, because he wanted to keep her there mad why she opened her eyes at him not as much as you look she retorted then you look as cross as if what's the pilgrim doing here billy demanded suddenly and untactfully who mr wallen she went into the pantry and came back with a plate for him why nothing he's just visiting it's sunday you know oh is it billy bent over the basin hiding his face from her i didn't know I kind of lost count of the days. Whereupon he made a great splashing in his corner and let her go without more words, feeling more than ever that he needed time to think. Just visiting cause it's Sunday, eh? The dickens it is. Meditating deeply, he was very deliberate in combing his hair and settling his blue tie and shaking the dust out of his white silk neckerchief and retying it in a loose knot. So deliberate that Mama Joy was constrained to call out to him, your dinner is getting cold mr boyle before he went in and took his seat where miss bridger had placed him and he doubted much her innocence in that matter elbow to elbow with the pilgrim how's shipping coming on billy inquired the pilgrim easily passing to him the platter of roast beef most through ain't ya the outfit's on the way in answered billy accepting noncommittally the meat and the overture for peace they'll be here in less than an hour if the pilgrim wanted peace, he was thinking rapidly, what grounds had he for ignoring the truce? He himself had been the aggressor, and he also had been the victor. According to the honor of fighting men, he should be generous. And when all was said and done, and the thought galled Billy more than he could understand, the offense of the pilgrim had been extremely intangible. It had consisted almost wholly of looks and a tone or two, and he realized quite plainly that his own dislike of the pilgrim had probably colored his judgment. Anyway, he had thrashed the pilgrim and driven him away from camp and killed his dog. Wasn't that enough? And if the pilgrim chose to forget the unpleasant circumstances of their parting and be friends, what could he do but forget also, especially since the girl did not appear to be holding any grudge for what had passed between them in the line camp? Billy, buttering a biscuit with much care, wished he knew just what had happened that night before he opened the door, and wondered if he dared ask her. Under all his thoughts, and through all, he hated the pilgrim. His bold blue eyes, his full, smiling lips, and smooth cheeks, as he had never hated him before. And he hated himself because, being unable to account even to himself for his feelings toward the pilgrim, he was obliged to hide his hate and be friends, or else act the fool and above all the mental turmoil he was somehow talking and listening and laughing now and then as if there were two of him and each one was occupied with his own affairs i wish to thunder there was three of me he thought fleetingly during a pause i'd set the third one of me to figuring out just where the girl stands in this game and what she's thinking about right now there's a kind of twinkling in her eyes now and then when she looks over here that sure don't line up with her innocent talk. I wished I could mind-read her stopping for meals, if you ask me. One cannot wonder that Charming Billy heard thankfully the clatter of his outfit arriving, or that he left half a piece of pie uneaten and hurried off on the plea that he must show them what to do, which would have caused a snicker among the men if they had overheard him. 
he did not mind dill following about nor did he greatly mind the pilgrim remaining in the house with miss bridger the relief of being even temporarily free from the perplexities of the situation mastered all else and sent him whistling down the path to the stables end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the long shadow by b m bower this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter fourteen a winter at the double crank there are times when although the months as they pass seem full nothing that has occurred serves to mark a step forward or back in the destiny of man after a year those months of petty detail might be wiped out entirely without changing the general trend of events and such a time was the winter that saw dill and bill as one alliterative mind called them in possession of the double crank the affairs of the ranch moved smoothly along toward a more systematic running than had been employed under brown's ownership dill settled more and more into the new life so that he was no longer looked upon as a foreign element he could discuss practical ranch business and be sure of his ground and it was then that billy realized more fully how shrewd a brain lay behind those mild melancholy blue eyes and how much a part of the man was that integrity which could not stoop to small meanness or deceit it would have been satisfying merely to know that such a man lived and if billy had needed any one to point the way to square living he must certainly have been better for the companionship of dill as to miss bridger he stood upon much the same footing with her as he had in the fall except that he called her flora in the familiarity which comes of daily association to his secret discomfort she had fulfilled her own prophecy and called him billy boy though he liked the familiarity he emphatically did not like the mental attitude which permitted her to fall so easily into the habit of calling him that also he was in two minds about the way she would come to the door of the living room and say come billy boy and dry the dishes for me that's a good kid billy had no objection to drying the dishes of a truth although that had been a duty which he shirked systematically in line camps until everything in the cabin was in that state which compels action he would have been willing to stand beside flora bridger at the sink and wipe dishes and watch her bare white arms with the dimply elbows from dark until dawn what he did object to was the half patronizing wholly matter-of-fact tone of her which seemed to preclude any possibility of sentiment so far as she was concerned she always looked at him so frankly with never a tinge of red in her cheeks to betray that consciousness of sex which goes ever say what you like with the love of a man and a maid he did not want her to call him billy boy in just that tone it made him feel small and ineffective and young he who was eight or nine years older than she it put him down so that he could not bring himself to making actual love to her and once or twice when he had tried it she took it as a great joke still it was good to have her there and to be friends the absence of the pilgrim who had gone east quite suddenly soon after the round-up was over and the generosity of the other fellows who saw quite plainly how it was with billy at least and forbore making any advances on their own account made the winter pass easily and left charming billy in the spring not content perhaps but hopeful it was in the warm days of late april the days which bring the birds and the tender young grass when the air is soft and all outdoors beckons one to come out and revel on such a day billy stirred to an indefinable elation because the world as he saw it then was altogether good crooned his pet song while he waited at the porch with flora's horse and his own they were going to ride together because it was sunday and because if the weather held to its past and present mood of sweet serenity he might feel impelled to start the wagons out before the week was done so that this might be their last sunday ride for nobody knew how long let's ride up the creek she suggested when she was in the saddle we haven't been up that way this spring there's a trail isn't there sure there's a trail but i don't know what shape it's in i haven't been over it myself for a month or so we'll try it but you won't find much to see it's all level creek bottom for miles and, and kind of monotonous to look at well we'll go anyway she decided and they turned their horses heads towards the west they had gone perhaps five or six miles and were thinking of turning back when billy found cause to revise the statement that there was nothing to see there had been nothing when he rode this way before but now 
when they turned to follow a bend in the creek and in the trail they came upon a camp which looked more permanent than was usual in that country a few men were lounging around in the sun and there were scrapers of the wheeled variety and wagons and plows and diverse other implements of toil that were strange to the place also there was a long reddish-yellow ridge branching out from the creek billy knew it for a ditch but a ditch larger than he had seen for many a day he did not say anything even when flora exclaimed over the surprise of finding a camp there but headed straight for the camp when they came within speaking distance a man showed in the opening of one of the tents looked at them a moment and came forward why that's fred walland cried flora and then caught herself suddenly i didn't know he was back she added in a tone much less eager billy gave her a quick look that might have told her much had she seen it he did not much like the color which had flared into her cheeks at the sight of the pilgrim and he liked still less the tone in which she spoke his name it was not much and he had the sense to push the little devil of jealousy out of sight behind him but it had come and changed something in the heart of billy why hello greeted the pilgrim and billy remembered keenly that the pilgrim had spoken in just that way when he had opened the door of the line camp upon them that night i was going to ride over to the ranch after a while how are you anyway he came and held up his hand to flora and she put her own into it billy with eyebrows pinched close thought that they sure took their own time about letting go again and that the smile which she gave the pilgrim was quite superfluous to the occasion you seem to be some busy over here he remarked carelessly turning his eyes to the new ditch well yes brown's having a ditch put in here we only started a few days ago them dat them no account swedes he got to do the rough work are so slow we're liable to be at it all summer how's everybody at the ranch how's your mother miss bridger has she got any mince pies baked i don't know you might ride over with us and see she invited smiling at him again we were just going to turn back weren't we billy boy sure he testified and for the first time found some comfort in being called billy boy because if looks went for anything it certainly made the pilgrim very uncomfortable the spirits of billy rose a little if you'll wait till i saddle up i'll go along i guess the swedes won't run off with the camp before i get back said the pilgrim and so they stayed and afterward rode back together quite amiably considering certain explosive elements in the party perhaps billy's mildness was due in a great measure to his preoccupation which made him deaf at times to what others were saying he knew that they were quite impersonal in their talk and so he drifted into certain other channels of thought was brown going to start another cow outfit or was he merely going to try his hand at farming billy knew that unless he had sold it brown owned a few hundred acres along the creek there and as he rode over it now he observed the soil more closely than was his habit and saw that from a passing survey it seemed fertile and free from either adobe or alkali it must be that brown was going to try ranching still he had held out all his best stock and billy had not heard that he had sold it since now that he thought of it he had not heard much about brown since dill bought the double crank brown had been away and though he had known in a general way that the pilgrim was still in his employ he did not know in what capacity in the absorption of his own affairs he had not given the matter any thought though he had wondered at first what crazy impulse caused brown to sell the double crank even now he did not know and when he thought of it the thing irritated him like a puzzle before it is solved so greatly did the matter trouble him that immediately upon reaching the ranch he left flora and the pilgrim and hunted up dill he found him hunched like a half-open jackknife in a cane rocker with his legs crossed and one long lean foot dangling loosely before him he was reading the essays of elia and the melancholy of his face gave billy the erroneous impression that the book was extremely sad and caused him to dislike it without ever looking inside the dingy blue covers say dilly old brown's putting in a ditch big enough to carry the whole missouri river did you know it dill carefully creased down the corner of the page where he was reading untangled his legs and pulled himself up a bit in his chair why no i don't think i've heard of it he admitted 
If I have, it must have slipped my mind, which isn't likely. Dill was rather proud of his capacity for keeping a mental grasp on things. Well, he got a bunch of men camped up on the creek and the pilgrim to close herd em, and I'm busy wondering what he's going to do with that ditch. Brown don't do things just to amuse himself. You can gamble he aims to make that dish pack dollars into his jeans. And if you can tell me how, I'll be a whole lot obliged. Dill shook his head, and Billy went on. Did you happen to find out when you was bargaining for the double crank how much land Brown's got held out? No, I can't say I did. From certain remarks he made, I was under the impression that he owns quite a tract. I asked about getting all the land he had, and he said he preferred not to put a price on it, but that it would add considerably to the sum total. He said I would not need it anyhow, as there is plenty of open range for the stock. He was holding it, he told me, for speculation, and had never made any use of it in running his stock except as they grazed upon it. Uh-huh. Well, that don't sound to me like any forty-acre field, does it to you? As I said, responded Dill, I arrived at the conclusion that he owns a good deal of land. And I'll bet you the old skunk is going to start up a cow outfit right under our noses. But why the dickens double crank wasn't good enough for him gets me. If he does, Dill observed calmly, the man has a perfect right to do so, William. We must guard against that greed which would crowd out everyone but ourselves, like pigs around a trough of sour milk. I will own, however. Say, Dilly, on the dead, are you religious? No, William, I am not in the sense you mean. I hope, however, that I am honest. If Mr. Brown intends to raise cattle again, I shall be glad to see him succeed. Charming Billy sat down suddenly, as though his legs would no longer support him and looked queerly at Dill. Hell, he said meditatively, and sought with his fingers for his smoking material. Dill showed symptoms of going back to the essays of Elia, so that Billy was stirred to speech. Now, looky here, Dilly. You're all right as far as you go, but this range is carrying just about all the stock it needs right at present. I don't reckon you realize that all the good bottoms and big coolies are getting filled up with nesters, one here and one there and every year a few more it ain't much of course but every man that comes is cutting down the range just that much and i know one thing when brown had this outfit hisself he was mighty jealous of the range and he didn't take none to the idea of anybody else shoving stock on to it more than naturally drifted on in the course of the season if he's going to start another cow outfit i'll bet you he's going to gobble land and that's what we better do, and do it sudden. Since I've never had much personal experience in the gobbling line, I'm afraid you'll have to explain, said Dill dryly. I mean leasing. We got to beat Brown to it. We got to start in and lease up all the land we can get our claws on. I ain't none desirable of trying to make you a millionaire, Dilly, whilst we only got one lone section of land and about 12,000 head of stock and somebody else aiming to throw a big lot of cattle onto our range. I kind of shy at any contract the size of that one. I got to start the wagons out, if this weather holds good, and I want to go with them, for a while anyhow, and see how things stack up on the range. And what you've got to do is to go and lease every foot of land you can, eh? State land. All the land round here, almost, is state land all that's surveyed and that ain't held by private owners and state land can be leased for a term of years the way they do it you start in and go over the map all sammy flea and lease a section here and there and skip one and take the next and so on and then if you need to you throw a fence around the whole blame chunk and there you are no it ain't cheating cause if anybody don't like it real bad they can raise the long howl and make you revise your fencing. But in this neck of the woods, folks don't howl over a little thing like that. Because you could lift up your own voice over something they've done, and they'd be a fine, pretty chorus. So that's what you can do if you want to. But anyway, you want to go right after that leasing. It'll cost you something. 
but we're just plumb obliged to protect ourselves, see? At this point he heard Flora laugh and got up hastily, remembering the presence of the pilgrim on the ranch. I see, and I will think it over and take what precautionary measures are necessary and possible. Billy, not quite sure that he had sufficiently impressed Dill with the importance of the matter, turned at the door and looked in again, meaning to add an emphatic word or two, but when he saw that Dill was staring round-eyed at nothing at all, and that Lamb was lying sprawled wide open on the floor, his face relaxed from its anxious determination. "'I got his think-works going. You'll do the rest,' he told himself satisfiedly, and pushed the subject from him. Just now he wanted to make sure the Pilgrim wasn't getting more smiles than were coming to him, and if he had left the decision of that with Billy, the Pilgrim would have had none at all. I wish he'd do something I could lay my fingers on, damn him, he reflected. I can't kick him out on the strength of my own private opinion. I'd just simply lay myself wide open to all kinds of remarks. I ain't jealous. He ain't got any particular stand-in with Flora. But if I started action on him, that's what the general verdict would be. Oh, thunder. Nothing of his thought showed in his manner when he went out to where they were. He found them just putting up a target made of a sheet of tablet paper marked with a lead pencil into rings and an uncertain center, and he went straight into the game with a smile. He loaded the gun for Flora, showed her exactly how to draw a fine bead, and otherwise deported himself in a way not calculated to be pleasing to the pilgrim. He called her Flora boldly whenever occasion offered, and he exulted inwardly at the proprietary way in which she said Billy Boy and ordered him around. Of course, he knew quite well that there was nothing but frank-eyed friendship back of it all, but the pilgrim plainly did not know and was a good deal inclined to sulk over his interpretation. So Billy, when came the time for sleeping, grinned in the dark of his room and dwelt with much satisfaction upon the manner of the pilgrim's departure. He prophesied optimistically that he guessed that would hold the pilgrim for a while, and that he himself could go on roundup and not worry any over what was happening at the ranch. For the pilgrim had come into the kitchen, ostensibly for a drink of water, and had found Miss Flora fussily adjusting the Klondike nugget pin in the tie of Charming Billy, as is the way of women when they know they may bully a man with impunity, and she was saying, "'Now, Billy boy!' If you don't learn to stick that pin in straight and not have the point standing out a foot, I'll... That is where the pilgrim came in and interrupted, and he choked over the dipper of water even as Billy choked over his glee, and left the ranch within fifteen minutes, he rode, as Billy observed to the girl, with a haughty spine. Oh, joy, chuckled Billy when he lived those minutes over again, and punched the pillow facetiously. Oh, joy, oh, Jonathan! I guess maybe he didn't get a jolt, huh? And the way, the, the very tone, when I called her Flora, sounded like the day was set for the wedding, and we'd gone and ordered the furniture. The mood of him was still triumphant three days after, when he turned in his saddle and waved his hand to Flora, who waved wistfully back at him. It ain't any sense right now, but I'll have her yet, he cheered himself when the twinge of parting was keenest. End of chapter 14。Chapter 16 of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Tom Penn。Chapter 16 – Self-Defense The wagons of the Double Crank had stopped to tarry over the fourth at Fighting Wolf Spring, which bubbles from under a great rock in a narrow draw that runs itself out to a cherry-masked point halfway up the side of Fighting Wolf Butte. Billy, with wisdom born of much experience in the ways of a roundup crew when the 4th of July draws near, started his riders at day dawn to rake all Fighting Wolf on its southern side. "'Better catch up your ridge runners,' he had cautioned. "'Cause I'll set you plumb afoot if you don't. The boys, knowing well his meaning, and that the circle that day would be a big one over rough country, saddled their best horses and settled themselves to a hard day's work. Till near noon they rode, and branded after dinner to the tune of much scurrying and bawling and a great deal of dust and rank smoke, 
urged by the ever-present fear that they would not finish in time but their leader was fully as anxious as they and had timed the work so that by four o'clock the herd was turned loose the fires drenched with water and the branding irons put away at sundown the long slope from fighting wolf spring was dotted for a space with men fresh shaven clean-shirted and otherwise rehabilitated galloping eagerly towards hardup fifteen miles away that they had been practically in the saddle since dawn was a trifle not to be considered they would dance until another dawn to make up for it hardup decked meagerly in the colors that spell patriotism was unwontedly alive and full of fourth of july noises but even with the distraction of a holiday and a dance just about to start and the surrounding country emptied of humans into the town the clatter of the double crank outfit fifteen wiry young fellows hungry for play brought men to the doors and into the streets charming billy because his eagerness was spiced with expectancy did not stop even for a drink but made for the hotel at the hotel he learned that his crowd was over at the hall and there he hurried so soon as he had removed the dust and straightened his tie and brushed his hair and sworn at his upstanding scalp lock in the corner of the hotel office dedicated to public cleanliness it was a pity that such single-hearted effort must go unrewarded but the fact remains that he reached the hall just as the couples were promenading for the first waltz he was permitted the doubtful pleasure of a welcoming nod from flora as she went by with the pilgrim dill was on the floor with mama joy and at a glance he saw how it was the pilgrim had butted in and come along with them he supposed flora really could not help it but it was pretty hard lines all the same for even in the rangeland are certain rules of etiquette which must be observed when men and women foregather in the pursuit of pleasure billy remembered ruefully how a girl must dance first last and oftenest with her partner of the evening and must eat supper with him besides whether she likes it or not to tweak this rule means to insult the man beyond forgiveness well it wouldn't hurt me none if flora did cut him off short billy concluded his eyes following them resentfully whenever they whirled down to his end of the room the way i've got it framed up i spoke for her first if dilly told her what i said still what he thought privately did not seem to have much effect upon realities flora he afterward saw intermittently while they danced a quadrille together and she made it plain that she had not considered billy as her partner how could she when he was trailing around over the country with the round-up and nobody knew whether he would come or not no mr wallen did not come to the ranch so very often she added naively that he was awfully busy he had ridden in with them and why not was there any reason billy though he could think of reasons in plenty turned just then to balance on the corner and swing and to do many other senseless things at the behest of the man on the platform so that when they stood together again for a brief space both were breathless and she was anxiously feeling her hair and taking out side combs and putting them back again and billy felt diffident about interrupting her and said no more about who was her partner an hour or so later he was looking about for her meaning to dance with her again when a man pushed him aside hurriedly and went across the floor and spoke angrily to another billy moving aside so that he could see discovered flora standing up with the pilgrim for the dance in another set that was forming the man who had jostled him was speaking to them angrily but billy could not catch the words he's drunk called the pilgrim to the floor manager put him out several men left their places and rushed over to them because flora was there and likely to be involved billy reached them first this was my dance the fellow was expostulating she promised it to me ah he's drunk repeated the pilgrim turning to billy it's gus venstrom he's got it in for me because i find him last week throw him out miss bridger isn't going to dance with a drunken stiff like him oh i'll go i ain't so drunk i've got to be carried retorted the other and pushed his way angrily through the crowd flora had kept her place though the color had gone from her cheeks she seemed to have no intention of quitting the quadrille so there was nothing for billy to do but get off the floor and leave her to her partner 
he went out after the swede and seeing him headed for the saloon across from the hotel followed aimlessly he was not quite comfortable in the hall anyway for he had caught mama joy eyeing him strangely and he thought she was wondering why he had not asked her to dance charming billy was not by nature a diplomat it never once occurred to him that he would better treat mama joy as if that half minute in the kitchen had never been he had said good evening to her when he first met her that evening and he considered his duty done he did not want to dance with her and that was in his opinion an excellent reason for not doing so he did not like to have her watching him with those big round blue eyes of hers so he stayed in the saloon for a while and only left it to go to supper when someone said the dance crowd was over there there might be some chance that would permit him to eat with flora there are moments in a town when even with many people coming and going one may look and see none when billy closed the door of the saloon behind him and started across to the hotel not a man did he see though there was sound in plenty from the saloons and from the hotel and the hall he was nearly half across the street when two men came into sight and met suddenly just outside a window of the hotel billy in the gloom of the starlight and no moon could not tell who they were he heard a sharp sentence or two saw them close together heard a blow then they broke apart and there was the flash of a shot one man fell and the other whirled about as if he would run but billy was then almost upon them and the man turned back and stood looking down at the fallen figure damn him he pulled a knife on me he cried defensively billy saw that it was the pilgrim who is he he asked and knelt beside the form the man was lying just where the lamplight streamed out from the window but his face was in shadow oh it's that swede he added and rose i'll get somebody i believe he's dead he left the pilgrim standing there and hurried to the door of the hotel office in any other locality a shot would have brought on the run every man who heard it but in a cow town especially on a dance night shots are as common as shouts in hard up that night there had been periodical outbursts which no one not even the women minded in the least so it was not until billy opened the door put his head in and cried come alive a fellow's been shot right out here that there was a stampede for the door the pilgrim still stood beside the other waiting three or four stooped over the man on the ground billy was one of them he pulled a gun on me explained the pilgrim i was trying to take it away from him and it went off billy stood up and as he did so his foot struck against a revolver lying beside the swede he looked at the pilgrim queerly but he did not say anything they were lifting the swede to carry him into the office they knew that he was dead even before they got him into the light somebody better get word to the coroner said the pilgrim fighting for self-control it was self-defense my god boys i couldn't help it he pulled a gun on me you saw it on the ground there right where he dropped it billy turned clear around and looked again at the pilgrim and the pilgrim met his eyes defiantly before he turned away i understood you to say it was a knife he remarked slowly the pilgrim swung back again i didn't or if i did i was rattled it was a gun that gun on the ground he met me there and started a row and said he'd fix me he pulled the gun and i made a grab for it and it went off that's all there is to it he stared hard at billy there was much talk among the men and several told how they had heard the swede cussin walland in the saloon that evening some remembered threats the threats which a man will foolishly make when he is pouring whiskey down his throat by the glassful no one seemed to blame walland in the least and billy felt that the pilgrim was in a fair way to become something of a hero it is not every man who has the nerve to grab a gun with which he is threatened they made a cursory search of the pilgrim and found that he was not armed and he was given to understand that he would be expected to stay around town until the coroner came and sat on the case but he was treated to drinks right and left and when billy went in to find flora the pilgrim was leaning heavily upon the bar with a glass in his hand and his hat far back on his head declaiming to the crowd that he was perfectly harmless so long as he was left alone but he wasn't safe to monkey with and any man who came at him hunting trouble would sure get all he wanted and then some he said he didn't kill people if he could help it but a man was plumb obliged to sometimes 
I'm sure surprised to think I got off with my life last winter when I hazed him away from the line camp. I guess I must have had a close call, all right, Billy snorted contemptuously and shut the door upon the wordy revelation of the pilgrim's deep inner nature, which had been, until that night, carefully hidden from an admiring world. The dance stopped abruptly with the killing. People were already going home. Billy, with the excuse that he would be wanted at the inquest, hunted up Jim Bleeker, gave him charge of the roundup for a few days, and told him what route to take. For himself, he meant to ride home with Flora or know the reason why. Come along, Dilly, and let's get out of town, he urged when he had found him. It's a kind of small burg, and at the rate the pilgrim is swelling up over what he's done, there won't be room for nobody but him in another hour. He's making me plumb nervous and afraid to be around him, he's so fatal. We'll go at once, William. Walland is drinking a great deal more than he should, but I don't think he means to be boastful over so unfortunate an affair. Do you think you are taking an altogether unprejudiced view of the matter? Our judgment, he added deprecatingly, is so apt to be warped by our likes and dislikes. Well, if that was the case here, Billy told him shortly, I've got dislike enough for him to wind my judgment up like a clock spring. I'll go see if Flora and her mother are ready. In that way, he avoided discussing the pilgrim, for Dill was not so dull that he failed to take the hint. End of chapter 16「Seventeen of the Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Seventeen. The Shadow Darkens. The inquest resulted to the satisfaction of those who wished well to the pilgrim, for it cleared him of all responsibility for the killing. Gustus Vinstrom had been drunk. He had been heard to make threats. He had been the aggressor in the trouble at the dance. And the pilgrim, in the search men had made immediately after the shooting, had been found unarmed. The case was very plainly one of self-defense. Billy, when questioned, repeated the pilgrim's first words to him, that the Swede had pulled a knife, and told the jury, on further questioning, that he had not seen any gun on the ground until after he had gone for help. Wallen explained satisfactorily to the jury. He may have said knife instead of gun. He had heard someone say that the Swede carried a knife, and he had been expecting him to draw one. He was rattled at first and hardly knew what he did say. He did not remember saying it was a knife, but it was possible that he had done so. As to Billy's not seeing any gun at first, they did not question the pilgrim about that, because Billy, in his haste and excitement, could so easily overlook an object on the ground. They gave a verdict of self-defense without any discussion, and the pilgrim continued to be something of a hero among his fellows. Billy, as soon as the thing was over, mounted in not quite the best humor and rode away to join his wagons. He had not ridden to the double crank to hear Flora talk incessantly of Mr. Walland and repeat many times the assertion that she did not see how, under the circumstances, he could avoid killing the man. Nor had he gone to watch Mama Joy dimple and frown by turns and give him sidelong glances, which made him turn his head quickly away. He hated to admit to himself how well he understood her. He did not want to be rude, but he had no desire to flirt with her and it made him rage inwardly to realize how young and pretty she really was, and how, if it were not for Flora, he might so easily be tempted to meet her at least halfway. She could not be more than four or five years older than Flora, and in her large, blonde way she was quite as alluring. Billy wished profoundly that she had gone to Klondike with her husband, or that Bridger had known enough about women to stay at home with a wife as young as she. He was glad in his heart when came the time to go. Maybe she would get over her foolishness by the time he came in with the roundup. At any rate, the combination at the ranch did not tempt him to neglect his business, and he galloped down the trail without so much as looking back to see if Flora would wave, possibly because he was afraid he might catch the flutter of a handkerchief in fingers other than hers. It was when the roundup was on its way in that Billy, stopping for an hour in Hardup, met Dill at the post office. "'Why, hello, Dilly!' he cried, really glad to see the tall, lank form come shambling in at the door. I didn't expect to see you off your own ranch. Anybody dead? It struck him that Dill looked a shade more melancholy than was usual even for him. Why, no, William. 
everyone is well very well indeed i only wrote in after the mail and a few other things i am always anxious for my papers and magazines you know if you will wait for half an hour you're going home i take it that's where i'm sure headed and we can ride out together easy as not we're through for a couple of weeks or so and i'm hazing the boys home to bust a few hosses before we strike out again i guess i'll just keep the camp running down by the creek going to be in town long enough for me to play a game of pool i was going right out again but there's no particular hurry said dill looking over his letters were you going to play with someone in particular no just the first gazebo i could rope and lead up to the table billy told him sliding off the counter where he had been perched i wouldn't mind a game myself dill observed in his hesitating way in the end however they gave up the idea and started for home because two men were already playing at the only table in hardup and they were in no mind to wait indefinitely outside the town dill turned gravely to the other did you say you were intending to camp down by the creek william he asked slowly why well, yes anything against it billy's eyes opened a bit wider that dill should question so trivial a thing oh no nothing at all dill cleared his throat raspingly nothing at all so long as there is any creek to camp beside i reckon you got something to back that remark has the creek went and run off somewhere billy said after a minute of staring william i have been feeling extremely ill at ease for the past week and i have been very anxious for a talk with you eight days ago the creek suddenly ran dry so dry that one could not fill a tin dipper except in the holes i observed it about noon when i led my horse down to water i immediately saddled him and rode up the creek to discover the cause he stopped and looked at billy steadily well i reckon you found it billy prompted impatiently i did i followed the creek until i came to the ditch mr brown has been digging i found that he had it finished and was filling it from the creek in order to test it i believe he added dryly he found the result very satisfying to himself the ditch carried the whole creek without any trouble and there was plenty of room at the top for more hell said billy just as dill knew he would say but he can't take out any more than his water right calls for he added you got a water right along with the ranch didn't you say i got three the third fourth and fifth i have looked into the matter very closely in the last week i find that we can have all the water there is after brown gets through his rights are the first and second and will cover all the water the creek will carry if he chooses to use them to the limit i suspect he was looking for some sort of protest from me for he had the papers in his pocket and showed them to me i afterward investigated as i said and found the case to be exactly as i have stated billy stared long at his horse's ears well you can't use the whole creek he said at last not unless he just turned it loose to be mean and i don't believe he can waste water even if he does hold the rights we can mighty quick put a stop to that do you know anything about injunctions if you don't you better investigate em a lot cause i don't know a damn thing about the breed and we're liable to need em bad i believe i may truthfully say that i understand the uses and misuses of injunctions william in the east they largely take the place of guns as fighting weapons and i think i may say without boasting that i can hit the bull's eye with them as well as most men but suppose mr brown uses the water suppose there is none left to turn back into the creek channel when he is through he has a large force of men at work running laterals from the main ditch which carries the water up and over the high land and i took the liberty of following his lines of stakes as you would put it william he seems about to irrigate the whole of northern montana certainly his stakes cover the whole creek bottom both above and below the main ditch and also the bench land above hell anything else i believe not except that he has completed his fencing and has turned in a large number of cattle i say completed though strictly speaking he has not he has completed the great field south of the creek and east of us 
but Mr. Walland was saying that Brown intends to fence a track to the north of us, either this fall or early in the spring. I know to a certainty that he has a good many sections leased there. I tried to obtain some of it last spring, and could not. Into the voice of Dill had crept a note of discouragement. Well, don't you worry none, Dilly. I'm here to see you pull out on top, and you'll do it, too. You're a crackerjack when it comes to the fine points of business, and I sure savvy the range into the game, so between us, we ought to make good, don't you think? You just keep your eye on Brown, and if you can slap him in the face with an injunction or anything, don't you get a sudden attack of politeness and let him slide. I'll look after the cow brutes myself, and if I ain't good for it, after all these years, I ought to be kicked plumb off the earth. The time has gone by when we could ride over there and haze his bunch clear out of the country on a high lope with our six guns back in our argument. I kind of wish, he added pensively, we hadn't got so damn decent and law-abiding. We could get action a heap more speedy and through with a dozen or fifteen buckaroos that liked to fight and had lots of shells and good horses. Why, I could have the old man's bunch shoveling dirt into that ditch to beat four aces in about fifteen minutes if but as you say dill cut in anxiously we are decent and law-abiding and such a procedure is quite out of the question oh, i ain't meditating no moonlight attack dilly but the boys would sure love to do it if i told em to get busy and i reckon we could make a better job of it than forty-nine injunctions and all kinds of law sharps careful william I used to be a law sharp myself, protested Dill, pulling his face into a smile. And I must own I feel anxious over this irrigation project of Brown's. He is going to work upon a large scale, a very large scale, for a private ranch. You have made it plain to me, William, how vitally important a wide, unsettled country is to successful cattle raising. And since then I have thought deeply upon the subject. I feel sure that Mr. Brown is not going to start a cattle ranch. If he ain't, then what? I am not prepared at present to make a statement, even to you, William. I never enjoyed recanting. But one thing I may say, Mr. Brown has so far kept well within his legal rights, and we have no possible ground for protest. So, you see, perhaps we would better turn our entire attention to our own affairs. Sure, I got plenty of troubles of my own, Billy agreed, more emphatically than he intended. Dill looked at him hesitatingly. Mrs. Bridger, he observed slowly, has received news that her husband is seriously ill. There will not be another boat going north until spring, so that it will be impossible for her to go to him. I am extremely sorry. Then, as if that statement seemed to him too bald, in view of the fact that they had never discussed Mama Joy, he added, It is very hard for Flora. The letter held out little hope of recovery. Billy, though he turned a deep red and acquired three distinct creases between his eyebrows, did not even make use of his favorite expletive. After a while, he said irritably that a man was a damn fool to go off like that and leave a wife and family behind him. He ought either to stay home or take them with him. He did not mean that he wished her father had taken Flora to Klondike, though he openly implied that he wished Mama Joy had gone. He knew he was inconsistent, but he also knew, and there was comfort as well as discomfort in the knowledge, that Dill understood him very well. It seemed to Billy, in the short time that the Roundup crew was camped by the creek, that no situation could be more intolerable than the one that must endure. He could not see Flora without having Mama Joy present also. Or, if he did find Flora alone, Mama Joy was sure to appear very shortly. If he went near the house, there was no escaping her. And when he once asked Flora to ride with him, he straightway discovered that Mama Joy had developed a passion for riding and went along. Flora had only time to murmur a rapid sentence or two while Mama Joy was hunting her gloves. Mama Joy has been taking the ladies' home journal, she said ironically and she has been converted to the idea that a girl must never be trusted alone with a man. I've acquired a chaperone now. Have you begun to study diplomacy yet, Billy boy? Does she chaperone you this fervent when the pilgrim's the man? countered Billy resentfully. 
he did not get an answer because mama joy found her gloves too soon but he learned his lesson and did not ask flora to ride with him again nevertheless he tried surreptitiously to let her know the reason and so prevent any misunderstanding he knew that flora was worrying over her father and he would like to have cheered her all he could but he had no desire to cheer mama joy as well he would not even give her credit for needing cheer so he stayed away from them both and gave his time wholly to the horse-breaking and to affairs in general and ate and slept in camp to make his avoidance of the house complete sometimes of a night when he could not sleep he wondered why it is that one never daydreams unpleasant obstacles and disheartening failures into one's air castles why was it that just when it had seemed to him that his dream was miraculously come true when he found himself complete master of the double crank where for years he had been merely one of the men when the one girl was also settled indefinitely in the household he called his home when he knew she liked him and had faith to believe he could win her to something better than friendship all these good things should be enmeshed in a tangle of untoward circumstances why must he be compelled to worry over the double crank that had always seemed to him a synonym for success why must his first and only love affair be hampered by an element so disturbing as mama joy why when he had hazed the pilgrim out of his sight and as he supposed out of his life must the man hover always in the immediate background threatening the peace of mind of billy who only wanted to be left alone that he and his friends might live unmolested in the air castle of his building one night just before they were to start out again gathering beef for the shipping season billy thought he had solved the problem philosophically if not satisfactorily i guess maybe it's just one of the laws of nature that you're always bumpin into he decided it's a lot like draw poker you can't get dealt out to you the cards you want without getting some along with em that you don't want what gets me is i don't see how in thunder i'm going to ditch my discard if i could just turn him face down on the table and count him out of the game old brown and his fences and his darn ditch and that dimply blonde person and a pilgrim oh hell wouldn't we rake in the stakes if i could straight away billy found another element added to the list of disagreeables or to follow his simile another card was dealt him which he would like to have discarded but which he must keep in his hand and play with what skill he might he was not the carefree charming billy boyle who had made prune pie for flora bridger in the line camp he looked older and there were chronic creases between his eyebrows and it was seldom that he asked tunefully can she make a pumpkin pie billy boy billy boy he had too much on his mind for singing anything it was when he had gathered the first trainload of big rollicky steers for market and was watching jim bleeker close the stockyard gate on the tail of the herd at tower the nearest shipping point that the disagreeable element came in the person of dill and the news he bore he rode up to where billy just inside the wing of the stockyards was sitting slouched over with one foot out of the stirrup making a cigarette dill did not look so much the tenderfoot these days he sat his horse with more assurance and his face was brown and had that firm hard look which outdoor living brings i looked for you in yesterday or the day before william he said when billy had greeted him with a friendly hello dilly and one of his illuminating smiles i'm ready to gamble old brown has been and gone and run the crick dry on you again bantered billy determined at that moment to turn his back on trouble no william you would lose the creek is running almost its normal volume of water i dislike very much to interfere with your part of the business william but under present conditions i feel justified in telling you that you must not ship these cattle just now i have been watching the market with some uneasiness for a month beef has been declining steadily until now it ranges from two ninety to three sixty and you will readily see william that we cannot afford to ship at that figure for various reasons i have not obtruded business matters upon you but i will now state that it is vitally important that we realize enough from the beef shipments to make our fall payment on the mortgage and pay the interest on the remainder it would be a great advantage if we could also clear enough for the next year's running expenses 
have you any idea how much beef there will be to ship this fall i figured on sixty or seventy cars said billy instinctively he had pulled himself straight in the saddle to meet this fresh emergency dill with a pencil and an old letter from his pocket was doing some 